come on up then. Let's uh, get you started. Thanks so much. Is it okay, Lou, if I do it from here? Yeah, yeah, great. Sure, sure. wonderful. Thank you. In terms of expansion, I can tell you my doctor says I'm expanding far too much every day. Yeah, me too. Yeah, they say a lot, a lot of trouble. Thank you so much, Lou, uh, not only for today, but for all you have done to push this topic. You are an American hero, uh, as well as the congressman and many others in this room, from you know the journalists, the scientists, the advocates, the pilots. It, it's just an honor to be here, and I appreciate what everyone has done. Uh, also, thank you, Red Water Board Directors, for letting me out of the meeting early. That was a wonderful discussion. I think this is going to be a lot more exciting. If I could point you to my opening slide, that is actually an image taken by the Blue Ghost Lear Lander with Redwire Argus cameras. I'm going to get in why that is such an extraordinary image in a moment. But before we get there, uh, we were having a discussion about substances and what these new substances would like, new materials, what this UAB technology would be. And I've been given the challenging, if not unenviable task of saying, how could UAP technology impact innovation without knowing quite what that UAP technology is? Uh, even fundamentally. So what I'd like to try and do today is give you an example of how microgravity is impacting innovation in really almost every industrial field and how that could be transformative. I don't know if extraterrestrial civilizations are using this. I think they likely would be, but I think this is an example of how a fundamental shift in technology could change everything. Uh, our company, Redwire, has been conducting experiments on the International Space Station on the Space Shuttle for literally decades. We have flown hundreds of experiments uh, over the past 35 plus years. We have 11 experiments active on the International Space Station right now, more than any other company. You see Senator John Glenn running one of our experiments there. The first one I'd like to show you is the Biofabrication Facility, the BFF. We're great at acronyms at uh, Redwire. If you could play the video, please. This is, by the way, an over 400 pound payload. It broke a table at our facility in Greenville, Indiana. Much easier to handle in orbit. That astronaut, a Cubs fan, working very quickly, a lot of coffee, at a 20 times speed, uh, but he's installing what is a biofabrication unit. And that system has allowed us to manufacture human tissue in space. It resulted in the first human meniscus being printed in space. Who needs a meniscus? I know I could probably use two, right? Exactly. This is the impact of microgravity, that if you tried to create that meniscus on Earth, and again, I'm a recovering attorney, so I'm gonna put it simply, it squishes. You couldn't do that in a gravity environment. It's not space per se, it's the lack of gravity that allows you to do these incredible things uh, subsequent to the success we had with the meniscus, we printed live cardiovascular tissue. And we brought it back from the International Space Station, still live. Think what this could mean for people suffering from heart disease, the creation of heart patches. And of course, the goal of all of this is ultimately to create whole organs in the space. How many of us have had friends and relatives die while waiting on an organ donation list? This could change all of that. Additionally, because we would be using your own stem cells to create the tissue, the organs, we would avoid the dangerous and expensive anti-rejection therapies that you go through. So we see how microgravity could have a dramatic impact in terms of life sciences, also pharmaceuticals. Redwire has flown 28 pill boxes. These are systems where we take pharmaceuticals, drugs, fly the seed crystals. And seed crystals, by the way, they're like a sourdough starting kit. They're what the drugs are made out of. And when you create seed crystals in microgravity, they're larger, more uniform, and that results in drugs with better efficacy, better longevity, fewer side effects. Here's an example that is very near and dear to my heart, insulin. We partnered with Eli Lilly, we flew insulin. Over on the left side of that, that's what insulin seed crystals look like when you create them on Earth. Over on the right side, that's what insulin looks like in space, the seed crystals. Again, I got a B minus in biology as a high school student. Even I can tell the difference between one and the other. And because of those larger or uniform crystals, you could have a version of insulin We've seen versions of cancer treatment drugs 
that whereas you have to go through chemotherapy that will be injected, again, long, painful, you could potentially get to a version of the drug uh, where it could be administered orally. So the tremendous difference here relative to the pharmaceutical sector, and by the way, it's not just us who know this, it's China. And the Chinese have their space station, they're going after the same research. So you know, Congressman, I would beg as we look at the International Space Station, replacing it with the Commercial Space Station, this revolution with biotech and microgravity is going to happen. The only question, is it going to happen here in America, in the free world, or is it going to be happening in China? And I do not want to be buying my next generation of pharmaceuticals and drugs from the Chinese. So we need to continue to support this, you know, create new developments, but this is just life sciences and biotech. Again, micrograv will impact semiconductors, the same principles when you form crystals in space. You can create new types of semiconductors that are more powerful, more tolerant of heat. Agriculture, you can create seeds, new types of plants that can flourish in the desert. We have a, a greenhouse that we're flying in space, looking at many of that efforts. You see that there. Uh, we also have systems for what's called Zeeblan fiber, where it's a new type of fiber optic that could be incredibly more powerful. Again, every aspect of our technological society could be changed by this innovation. Is this something that UAP are using? Is this new substances that they're using? I don't know, perhaps. But you see how this field will revolutionize everything. And I believe in the future, the leaders of microgravity will not only be the leaders in economics, but in national security as well. As a matter of fact, that meniscus sprint, the customer for that was the Uniform Services University because the number one injury to our men and women in uniform are meniscus tears. Now I'd like to talk about, who wants to see some unclassified data, <laughs> right? Let's talk about some imagery that we're getting from NASA. As Lou mentioned, I was proud to be a member of NASA's UAP independent study team. We had some very common sense recommendations one of which that I testified here in the house not too long ago, alongside mm -hmm. the great Lou Elizondo and others, was that we need to go into the NASA archives, get the imagery, review it, make it public, and look at what we've got. This is an example that hit the internet not too long ago. Is it Tic Tac? It's on Mars? I don't know. I'm not qualified to say, but someone should be looking at it, and we should be collecting and collating the data Here's one that's even more interesting to me. Lunar horizon glow. This is a phenomena that we first saw with the surveyor systems. This is, as it's named, a glow that we're seeing on the horizon of the moon. We saw it with the robotic surveyors, and what you see in the upper left-hand side are sketches that Apollo astronauts made of this phenomena. A glowing dome, streaks of light shooting out from the lunar surface, Pretty extraordinary. And then most recently, this was my cover slide, with the Blue Ghost system, which is NASA's commercial lunar payload services built around CLIPS, a wonderful public-private partnership to reach the moon. With red wire Argus cameras, we took this image of the lunar horizon glow. What you might hear uh, if you go on a NASA website or talk to some in the scientific community is that this effect is from dust that has been electrostatically charged and then levitated to create this impact. Now, again, I'm not saying one way or the other, but um, Dr. And, and I should go back to give him uh, credit. Uh, Dr. Manischetz, direct child, I, I gotta, I gotta mess up his name. I apologize. It's in the slides. But a wonderful professor who's been associated with the UAP Disclosure Fund uh, and doing work on this talk, it provided me these slides. And I can tell you, NASA's own research, LADI, other systems, is putting some big question marks as to even if there is enough dust to create this effect, which looks unlikely, and that if dust could be electrostatically charged to cause what, I mean, looks like a second sunrise. And that's not the sun, by the way, it's below the horizon. I mean, that is an extraordinary image. And by the way, when I first saw this picture, uh, I was like, is that algae on the moon? And what you're seeing is light reflect refraction occurring due to, I don't know what. So I don't know what this is. Is it a dome? Is it some type of natural phenomena? that we don't understand or aren't aware of, 
but I'll tell you definitely it's a unidentified anomalous phenomenon, which bears looking at and bears understanding. And this is a good example too of even if it's a natural or prosaic phenomenon, there's something extraordinary occurring here. We should be delving into it. We should be studying it and understanding. And on the off chance that it does turn out to be something extraordinary, I mean, we need to know what is occurring here. Uh, additionally, here's another shot publicly available from the NASA archives. You've seen some imagery of the triangular UAPs in the past. What's that? Debris? Mm -hmm. Satellites? And that's from the moon, right, Mike? It's, that's Apollo 17. We had that picture. Implement it. Images for Apollo 17. A few of us saw something like that uh, last Friday, yep. actually. Extraordinary. Satellites, debris, Klingons. What is it? I don't know. Lou, do you know? Congressman, you know what that is? Why are we not investigating this? And what I would ask of our brave members of Congress who are here is, again, with relatively little effort and money, we should be leveraging AI and ML to go into the NASA archives. So much of this has been digitized more every day and conduct a review of what's publicly available on UAP. We spend so much time here, and justifiably so, talking about classified material, what's being hidden, yet there is a treasure trove of data that, if not a smoking gun, certainly is fascinating and worth looking at and applying the scientific method to. And these images that you're seeing here, and, and here's more of another UAP from Apollo, more of potentially Stonehenge, strange structures on the moon, lunar anomalies that look like Buddhist temples. And I'm not saying necessarily all of these have extraordinary explanations. Maybe some of them don't, maybe some of them do, but it certainly is worth the effort to investigate. And we're not doing that right now. Why? Because of the stigma, this pernicious stigma that prevents us from tackling it. And sir, that's where we're going to need your help. That I have many friends at NASA that are interested in this topic, fascinated by it, want to delve into it, that they need top cover. And that's why I'd be so grateful to maybe offline talk more about what we can do with a new NASA administrator coming in. And this isn't going to cost a lot of money. You know, this could be done with very little time, very little effort, yet the results could be extraordinary. Finally, as we get back to technology, I just wanted to level set relative to what it takes to travel in space. Three days to the moon, seven to 10 months to Mars. I can tell you exposure to radiation during that trip, quite dangerous and challenging. 77,000 years to Proxima Centauri, our closest star. I mean, that's worse than my flights on United. I mean, that is <laughs> rough. And then 1.7 million years to get to where we've seen some biosignatures for the first time. If we're truly going to explore space, we're going to need some innovative technology. And here we already spent some time discussing the Alcubierre warp drive. This was a Mexican physicist who did the initial work proving that within demonstrated science, and I would defer to Eric Davis here, but, but this is not extraordinary science, that a warp drive could exist. The challenge with Alcubierre's warp drive is that it would require roughly the mass of Jupiter converted into energy to operate. I mean, I had a Chevy Suburban and, and that was not fuel efficient. This would be even more difficult. But a scientist at NASA, what was then NASA's Eagle Works, tweaked basically the architecture of the Alcubierre warp drive and perhaps found some ways to get that down to more the mass of the VW, you know, something that we could work with. So. These are the kinds of technologies that if there is a gravitic system or some kind of extraordinary technology, we must have it in order to reverse those distances and have America and our international partners lead in space exploration. Additionally, energy. I mean, if we are sitting on extraordinary technology, zero point energy, the Casimir effect as we discussed, think of the good we could do in terms of saving the environment, improving the economy, creating a post-scarcity society. It would be extraordinary, it would be wonderful. And let me just end by saying, the reverse of that is 
we do not want to fall behind China relative to leveraging extraordinary technology. I don't know if there's alien tech out there. There may be, there might not be, but can we risk falling behind the Chinese in reverse engineering if there is such technology? And this is again where the stigma is so pernicious that I'm sure China has its top officials working on this 24 seven coordinated, whereas us, it's separated, it's compartmentalized, is NIT working on it, is Caltech working on it? No, we cannot risk losing the communist China because we can't take this issue seriously. We must not let a lack of vision turn into a lack of freedom. Thank you, Liv.